Ron. Thank you very much, Caetano, and also thanks, Antonio, for putting a great symposium together, although unfortunately many of the early talks were at 3 a.m. my time. Uh, and this is a really good follow-on to many of the things that Matteo uh, just spoke about. So, if you think about it, nearly all immune function that isn't mediated by soluble mediators occurs in complex lymphoid or parenchymal tissues, and therefore you cannot explore it by looking at just isolated cells or molecules, and that means we need to image and when we think of imaging, we talk about both dynamic and high content information collection. And there are a whole series of questions we'd like to address in thinking about that. We'd like to look at the dynamics and normal and pathological responses in vivo and how that relates to function, how tissue microanatomy, the organization of secondary lymphoid tissue contributes to host defense, but also disease understand at a more mechanistic level, molecular signals that guide this positioning and movement. And then finally, look at the nature and consequences of crosstalk between immune cells and parenchymal sites in a way very similar to what Matteo just talked about in terms of hepatocytes versus uh, hematopoietic cells in the liver. And so one of the methods that he's already mentioned that we and others have used for many years to look at this is multi-photon dynamic imaging. It gets you these temporal aspects of biology, but is limited in most cases to fewer than five parameters. Uh, it's hard to do signaling measurements. Calcium is pretty reasonable. Others are difficult. NFAT is really just an, a, a calcium analog. And you can observe things from seconds to hours. In most cases, uh, if you try to do it longer, you can do it iteratively, but then you lose true cell tracking. And except for certain explant models where you're not looking at the trafficking of cells from the blood, you can't apply this to humans. Uh, the method uh, involves in almost all cases, but uh, skin, uh, the surgical exposure of the tissue of interest. And so one technical point I wanna make sure everybody understands is that you, if you're doing surgery, you cause inflammation and you need very careful controls to be sure that what you're observing is not an artifact of inducing surgical inflammation in the tissue. You then scan your laser in an XY dimension and get a plane of imaging information, focus up and down to get a stack repeat this over time and play back these movies, uh, some of which you saw in Mateo's talk. Here we're looking at naive T cells in the paracortical region of a lymph node. And it's very deceptive looking at these green cells moving in this black background at about 300 times real speed, because these few fluorescent cells are really in this environment. They're always touching something else, but you just don't see the something else. So a second caveat about 2P imaging is Never believe what an imager tells you based on what he or she does not see. In other words, always worry about what's in the black. And the way that the, the better people who are doing these experiments control for this is to have experimental and control cells in the same imaging field. So at least the black is the same and you should look for that in the papers. And so we and others have used this to look at dynamics and lymph nodes to figure out, as Mark Vaginov showed in the lab years ago, that T cells move along fibroblastic particular networks where they meet up with dendritic cells to look at dynamics in germinal centers, uh, to look at uh, dendritic cell sampling, gut microbiota, to look at uh, activity in the kidney, uh, look at the myeloid components and the T cell components in granulomas in liver, and also with a little bit more difficulty in lung, uh, to look at innate responses such as these neutrophils responding to a wounding uh, event in the ear skin, to look at uh, CD4 T cells in that same environment, uh, to look at osteoclasts and other marrow cells, and more recently, to look at the resident tissue uh, macrophages that were just mentioned and how they protect against neutrophilic damage. So it's a very nice technique for many things, but we only look at this very small volume, even in a mouse lymph node. And so not only are we concerned about what's in the black in the imaging volume, but about what else is happening in the completely black space where you don't actually do the two photon imaging. And so we decided years ago to always take our preps after live imaging and do histochemistry, only to realize as immunologists that the typical way that um, histochemistry was done at the time we started doing this 10 or 12 years ago was two or three parameters and not the four or five parameters per cell for modern immunophenotyping with most people on flow cytometers doing 12 to 15 parameter uh, analyses at the time. 
And so we and others over the years have developed multiplex static methods. They don't capture dynamics, but as I'll show you, the parameter space can easily exceed 40 to 50. I'll give you an example of 80 parameters. And we can probe signaling and post-translational modifications with the right reagents. We can study proteins and RNA with a little bit more difficulty, but that's coming online. And we can obviously use this with ethically collected human material. So our original method derived uh, by, from work by Mike Gerner when he was in the lab is called histocytometry. We could stain in up to 14 colors, uh, deconvolve to improve the image quality, do channel compensation just as you would do in flow, and then use software tools to create synthetic cellular objects, segmented objects where we also collected all the fluorescent information. Well, cellular objects with fluorescent information is flow cytometry data. So we could now take this information, gate as you would do in flow cytometry, get quantitative information. But since we have the XYZ coordinates of these cells, print any of the gated information back in the original image. So we would know the positions of each of these carefully identified cell subsets. Uh, I'll show you how this works with human samples in a moment. It works with antiphosphoprotein and anti-cytokine antibodies under at least limited conditions. So we can look at the phenotype of cells, their signaling state, their functional state, and position them in the tissue, uh, which is something you don't do with isolated single cell uh, technology. So an example of how this works, if we would stain with B220, to isolate, uh, identify B lymphocytes in the mouse and gate around these cells and make them blue. Uh, use CD3 to identify T cells and gate around these cells and make them red. Flow gel will give us a beautiful sagittal section of a lymph node with peripheral B cell follicles and a more central paracortical region. We've done quantitative analyses to see how histocytometry compares to flow cytometry and for naive T and B cells in mouse, mouse lymph nodes or spleen, we get a, a very, very nice quantitative correlation. However, if we go to look at dendritic cells, what we find is that <clears throat> we get this very small sliver, very hard for you to even to see it, of dendritic cells, unless we go to great lengths to digest and extract them from the tissue, whereas under the same conditions, the quantification by histocytometry shows this much larger number. Uh, the situation gets even worse if you use an immunized animal, the activated antigen-specific T cells stick to these dendritic cells, and then you throw those T cells away as well when you try to extract them on a, and put them through a filter. And so I want to point out that this underrepresentation uh, by flow applies to CYTOF, single-cell RNA-seq, all these single-cell methods. And we and others have um, done this type of quantification in various tissues under various conditions, and in almost all cases, uh, myeloid and stromal components in particular are highly underrepresented in the data sets that you get. So gold, uh, the ground truth is not the single cell methods that most of you are familiar with. It's actually quantitative imaging. Now, that histocytometry was very nice and 12 to 14 parameters at the extreme was, was good, but it's not nearly enough to really characterize what's happening in tissue space. So we have uh, developed methods that enable us to look at a variety of immune cells and immune cell states, epithelial and stromal cells, structural elements, tumor cells where that's relevant. And this is work uh, from Andrea Radke and Evelyn Kandoff in the lab. It's a new method called IVEX. Uh, it enables us to do iterative staining with intermittent bleaching. And I'm happy to answer questions about details later, but I'm not gonna go through this now. Uh, the main point is this is a completely open source um, system, so you can choose any antibodies you want as long as you can get them in the right colors. Uh, and we've carried this out, as I'll show you in a minute, to more than 80 parameters with high um, registration of all the data sets so that you really can get extremely dense data uh, about what's happening in the tissue. And we validated hundreds of antibodies for both mouse uh, and multiple uh, relevant tissues in the human. So here's a mouse lymph node stained in 82 different colors, of which 67 actually react in the mouse lymph node. Only four colors are shown here. And it's a fairly large object, um, almost four millimeters by four millimeters squared. And that raises a question. If it's difficult to do iterative binary gating on 15 or 20 parameters, and CYTOF gets pretty complicated at 40 parameters, what do you do with 80 parameters? Uh, when you also have all the spatial information, not just the, the color information per cell. 
And so Nishant Thakur in the lab has worked uh, on an artificial intelligence machine learning approach where he, uh, which is called rapid. And what it does is ignore segmentation. It takes all the different channels, 82 in the case I just shown you, and collapses them down to three channels that are recolored red, green, and blue. And then those colors are rescaled quantitatively because using immunofluorescence rather than histochemistry, we can distinguish dim from medium and bright in ways that matter to immunologists. And this is a reversible algorithm. So once the uh, procedure has identified what I will define in a moment as a, a cluster, it's reversible so that you can look at all the elements that give rise to that particular cluster. So what do I mean by a cluster? So we take this original um, immunofluorescent pattern and rapid translates it to what you see on the bottom, where now all the information is displayed, not just the four out of the 82 colors I show you in the top. And these individual colors are not the way you normally look at fluorescence data, where somebody is showing you uh, the red channel or the green channel, or the blue channel, each of which represents one uh, antibody stain. The pseudo colors here represent a cluster of markers defining a cell type. So if we look at this germinal center in more detail, the algorithm has picked out a cluster that's defined by these four markers, uh, CD1C, CD20, HLA-DR, and IgD. And that defines naive B cells. And you see that these cells are all positioned outside of the germinal center. These six parameters were automatically identified as a particular cluster designation that corresponds to GCB cells and they're all inside the germinal center. The majority of the proliferating B cells defined by these parameters are in the dark zone over here, whereas the majority of TFH defined by this other set of parameters, including high, very high PD-1, uh, are in the light zone and so forth. So we now have a way of extracting the equivalent of very dense um, iterative binary gating to identify cells where it's done in an automated way and where we get quantitative information on every population and we also get the spatial information so that we can now do uh, statistical analyses of where cells lie relative to each other in the tissue space. Uh, again, we're very greedy in our imaging and a section despite doing 82 different parameters under samples tissue space so we've worked out a new way of doing tissue clearing uh, that preserves the ability to do this kind of multiplex staining. And so here's an example of a mouse lymph node, no sectioning, so a millimeter cubed, uh, stained in five colors at a time uh, and imaged in toto. So we get to see, and I'm gonna go back here for a second, this arborization of these fat yellow vessels, the HEVs, which is something that you will not see when we go into the slice mode here because the cross sections would just uh, show you the small HEV regions and you wouldn't appreciate that three-dimensional structure, but we can of course go through these images at every Z level and use uh, histocytometry to quantify and uh, identify all the cell types, or we can use rapid uh, to do this where we now can identify and position if we use a few more parameters, all the cells in this large volume. And so I want to come to the science here in which we've used histocytometry and 3D multiplex imaging to come up with a new understanding of how regulatory T cells work in tissue. And this is really the fantastic work of a, a terrific fellow in the lab, Harry Wong. Uh, we've collaborated with Kim Young Park and John Sang's lab, uh, also with Sasha Radensky and Pete Savage uh, and, and other people that are, that are listed here. And so this is built off of an observation we published a few years ago that showed that Tregs do not work by preventing autoreactive cells from becoming activated. The autoreactive cells become activated. They even make cytokines as shown here by IL-2. But that IL-2 is sensed by neighboring uh, Tregs and they become PSTAT5 positive, whereas the uh, autoreactive cell itself does not show PSTAT5 positivity. And so we understood what Tregs don't do. They don't prevent the activation of autoreactive cells, but that left open the question then of how you avoid autoimmunity, and that's what Harry has worked on. The first thing he did was to move away from identifying the autoreactive cells by IL-2, which is a very fraught method. It's doable but difficult. 
uh, and uh, went and showed that PD-1 expression is actually a very good way to characterize uh, the autoreactive cells in the steady state. This shows you a PD-1 positive CD4 T cell that is FOXP3 negative. You don't see any of these green nuclei here. And this just shows you the, the other markers, CD3, CD4. And I'm just going to summarize why we think these are autoreactive, which is that they are in the same place and in the same number in skin draining lymph nodes of germ-free mice. So there are no food antigens and there are no other known exogenous antigens uh, giving rise to this activated phenotype. <clears throat> and in accordance with our earlier data, these PD-1 positive cells are typically PSTAT5 negative. We can then develop a series of tools of spatial statistics in which we then take the PD-1 positive cells and we quantify uh, their uh, neighbors in great detail using the multiplex imaging. And when we do that, what we find is that Tregs are not uniformly or randomly distributed in the lymph node. They form small microdomains and clusters, and those clusters are uniquely around the PD-1 positive cells that we are calling autoreactive, and they're not clustered around the remainder of the PD-1 negative naive cells in that same lymph node. We can use the complex staining to identify those cells in a greater depth phenotypically, and we see that there are actually four different clusters of cells. Cluster three and four are relatively closely related and quite distinct from cluster one and two. And these cells are characterized by uh, expressing Chi67, uh, a high level of CD25, of PD1, they're PSTAT5 positive, high for CTLA4 and for FOXP3. And again, that cluster of uh, what we would call effector T regs are the ones that are localized around the PD1 positive cells, whereas the so called uh, naive T regs are more randomly distributed and not clustered near the autoreactive cells. And the data I'm not going to have time to go through, we can show that these effector phenotype T regs are entirely IL 2 dependent. And therefore, it says that T regs, consistent with our earlier data, are not uh, pre-suppressing the autoreactive response. They're working in a negative feedback mode in response to the activation of the self-reactive conventional cells to adopt a higher suppressive state and in some way control uh, that autoreactive ongoing response. It turns out that, as I mentioned, there's CHI-67 positivity in those clustered Tregs in these microdomains using a trick that uh, Caetano used uh, in earlier work to look at the distribution and origin of um, the populations of dendritic cells in tissues. We've used confetti mice to look at whether that uh, microdomain is formed merely by, for example, chemokine driven aggregation or whether, for example, IL 2 might drive the local proliferation of the Tregs to form the microdomains. You can see this cluster of like-colored uh, Tregs here, and if we do the statistics, it's very clear that there is local uh, clustering that's non-random, uh, and that clustering does not occur if you block IL-2. So putting all the data together, it's fairly clear that what happens is that those microdomains form from local expansion driven by the IL-2 produced by the autoreactive cells, which then results in a kind of feed-forward amplification of the highly, of a highly suppressive Treg microdomain. And one of the main things this does is to make absolutely sure those conventional cells do not sense IL-2, consistent with the fact that it's the Treg, but never the PD-1 positive cell that's PSTAT5 positive. That's all prelude to then really asking the question, well, how are Tregs preventing autoimmunity? And to really address that question, we needed to have high temporal control over when the autoreactive cells were first sensing their uh, self ligand to be able to follow their fate uh, from that time point. All the other data I'm showing you is in polyclonal responses that are asynchronous. And so to do this, we needed to do adoptive transfer of uh, autoreactive transgenic cells. And we've used this particular transgenic that's specific for a gastric ATPase peptide 
uh, small numbers of these cells in a normal animal with Tregs that uh, are uh, sort of unnoticed by the animal, but if we remove Tregs, they will drive an autoimmune gastritis. Now, the trick here is that we want to do this experiment at physiological frequencies of antigen-specific cells, and that normally would be something that would be impossible to analyze in situ. But with the clearing method that we have developed, we are now able to visualize all the cells in an entire lymph node where we're, we have quantitative accuracy down to perhaps about five cells in the entire lymph node. So we can do these transfers at what I would call a Jenkins frequency with precursor frequencies of perhaps 100 cells in the entire animal and 10 or 20 of these antigen-specific cells in the gastric lymph node when we do this experiment. And so here we're looking at a cleared uh, gastric lymph node. Red are the endogenous Tregs. And then you'll see that there are this very small number of purple cells. Those are the tracked uh, autoreactive cells. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we always put control cells into the same imaging volume. Those are the cells in green. And if we put a cohort in and then basically trap them by preventing no more cells from coming in by blocking with any 62 l and nobody leaving by blocking with FTY, we can now quantitatively assess what happens over time in cohorts of animals. And the surprise was that for the first three days, these autoreactive cells, even in the presence of fully functional Tregs, proliferate. But a week later, they've gone back to or dropped below their original number. Ron, we seem to have lost you. Are you there? So let's hope that Ron manages to reconnect. Let's give him a few minutes. So just to, I sent a message to Ron Germain and let's see if uh, he is able uh, to get back to us. So uh, please just be uh, patient for a few minutes. Am I back? You are back, Ron. Excellent. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, Comcast uh, randomly shuts down my internet at times, which it just did. So I had to reconnect a different way. I apologize. So anyway, to say and I'm just about finished here, the way that uh, this all works, as far as we can tell, is that uh, the literature suggests that conventional cells are selected at modest uh, affinity during positive selection, whereas Tregs are selected at slightly higher uh, self-antigen uh, affinity. When they meet up with a dendritic cell bearing the self-antigen, the low reactivity of these conventional cells at the margin, perhaps, perhaps for the best of these cells, uh, gives you a little bit of CD25 expression and a small amount of IL-2 production. The Tregs, because of their better engagement of self, put up more CD25, and that enables them to steal 
file two, as Mike Leonardo first reported, and consistent with what we see uh, in the sense that the Tregs are the PSTAT5 positive population, the conventional cells are the IL-2 producing population, but they themselves did not become IL-2 positive. That results in this local microdomain formation of effector Tregs that uh, reinforce this uh, stealing as well as depress any further IL-2 production based on uh, high CTLA-4 interference with co-stimulation uh, and the production of other immunosuppressive molecules. Now, what is surprising and what is new here uh, is that you get proliferation even under those conditions. And this comes in part because I think many of us have misunderstood what IL-2 does. IL-2 does not drive naive T cells into proliferation. The reason that you see them as, as see it as a T cell growth factor is that when TCR signals and MIC upregulation, as Phil Hodgkin has reported, uh, put the cells into cycle, if they don't see IL-2, they cannot survive under those proliferative conditions. And so the stealing of IL-2 in the face of activate, TCR activation of the conventional autoreactive cells leads to their pruning from the repertoire, as I've shown you. And because we have very quantitative data here, together with Kim Young Park, we've been able to create a very a detailed model that involved three different cell types, dendritic cells, CD4 cells, and Tregs. We've also been able to include molecular components and intracellular signaling components, as well as spatial features in this model. And I obviously don't have time to walk you through all of that, but the modeling uh, and confirmatory experiments show that, that small, less than twofold changes in CTLA-4 expression by Tregs or a 40% decrease in their local density imbalances this tuning and enables the uh, responding autoreactive cells to escape this IL-2 stealing control, become PSTAT-5 positive and survive to seed the initiation of an autoimmune response. And these data completely agree with evidence that CTLA-4 heterozygotes in humans have autoimmune disease or in at least NOD models and perhaps in humans, small decreases in Treg drive autoimmunity. And so this has uh, very important implications for understanding how genetic polymorphisms like E2TLs contribute to autoimmunity and also for attempts to modulate, modulate Treg, something we heard about in the questions for um, Mateo's talk. You're sitting on a knife edge here where if you <clears throat> um, activate the Tregs too much, you'll begin to suppress useful immune responses. And if you uh, allow that IL-2 to access the, the potentially autoreactive cells, they can then escape from the regulatory phenomenon. And so this is why it's been perhaps rather difficult to tune IL-2 treatments to give you the uh, desired results. Let me end by saying that we want to combine what I've talked about today. And so uh, Jail Hoare in the lab is working on what we call a new form of correlative microscopy where he actually does the kind of 2P imaging that I didn't talk about in detail today, only technically, and then goes into the 3D uh, imaging and staining in static sections, does complete registration for all the objects that were tracked during the 2P run and essentially plays the movie backward. So we then can relate, relate this very densely phenotypically analyzed state of the cells at the end of the imaging run to their prior behavior dynamically. Who do they interact with? Where are they positioned? To really get the most information about what's happening in tissues. And this is part of a larger picture of using dynamic imaging, um, modest plex, high plex staining, the uh, natural learning algorithms and talking about the 3D imaging and in work I haven't talked about, the combination of these protein analyses with uh, RNA analysis to really understand the immune system in the tissue context. Thanks very much, and I apologize for the short gap.